Disc 41285. Hello Gunters. I bet you never thought you'd hear from me again. The boys were kind enough to let me welcome you to Episode 3. Chapter 3 of Ready Player One. Let's get to the good part. Cue the music. Welcome to The Good Part. I'm Ryan. I'm John. And I'm Chris. And we're back this week with Chapter 3 of Ready Player One, a chapter that begins and ends in a standalone simulation hosted by Wade's online pal H, a renowned gunter and PvP juggernaut. The chat room modeled after a suburban basement circa when other than the 1980s acts as a meeting spot for o the Oasis's most elite gunters. So, The Basement gentlemen the question has come up in our slack and i think amongst us a few times what would you guys do or what would you make as your basement if you had the means within the oasis to create your standalone simulation or chat room you know i've given it a little bit more thought uh, okay. i think that the war bunker from Shit, what was the movie? War Games? Yeah, of course. You know, it, War Games. <laughs> that war you know, movie with the game. You know, the fucking room the movie was named after. <laughs> and I appreciate you following along with me there. I, I think that would be kick-ass. Because think about it, all right? First off, you've got this kick-ass underground bunker. Or maybe you start off coming through and, and the giant-ass metal doors closing behind you. Like, that's the animation for entering the war bunker. I and mean, maybe because, you know, it's a long ass tunnel to actually get to the war room aspect. But I might have the different rooms within the giant war room because, you know, the surrounding rooms where he was like locked up and he had to like hack through the through the, uh, the the lock system or whatnot. But maybe have different rooms with different video game consoles just lined up. So it's like arcade slash war room and you have those desks with the built in computers and all of those have got arcade systems in it. Maybe people's games playing up on the screen so just kind of like a an initial sort of competitive thing you could have sort of a side room where a movie's playing or uh or people could go up to the whopper and just kind of hang out and and chit chat and whatnot but i think that would be kind of a a cool place to sort of retrofit for hangout mode or swinging mode rather than wartime mode it, it's a good one it's a good one. It's just not as cozy as the basement, though. It's not. It's a little cold. No, it I is agree. a little cold. It's I, real cold. I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking you'd have to pimp it out a little bit. I think you have to. I think you have to warm it up. Some pimp shag carpet. My war room. <laughs> I, I'm just thinking, like, if you if you broke in, you remember when uh, uh, in in what well, was in the last Terminator? There was a few Terminators ago where where they they break into the the underground bunker and it's like dusty and really old computers and the war that's is not a bunker up. that's a fucking cellar man <laughs> i was, it was <laughs> well, no it that, was is, a that is a living. hole in the ground with a ply, like a piece of plywood on top of it <laughs> what oh you that's, talking that's about the one with the helicopter that went in we're talking where bigger. he goes and gets it's the like... guns right no where, no, where no. sarah connor has the dream in terminator 2 uh, is that what no. you're talking about no no where, it's like where, the where third or fourth no one fear into the table no, no. This is this is the later one. We're talking about the the one where uh, dude goes. Oh, the uh, one with Christian Bale. <laughs> no, that the, not that, that was one. The best of the series. <laughs> not that the one before that. <laughs> you know where they end up having to escape and and it's there in an underground bunker, but it's like a real ass bunker, not like some shit with cardboard on top. All right, so so Chris chooses a real ass bunker, John. <laughs> What's your choice? Yeah, the Ghostbusters headquarters would be really good, but then, you know, you open a, you open well, I, guess, I don't know if you'd open the door, but you'd go into a door and it'd be like Scrooge McDuck's like safe room. Fuck yeah! You know? uh, there you go. And then you want to go you know, back? You've got like some a, coins. You've got some good call. <laughs> place in the floor where you drop down into the lower levels of Fraggle Rock, and then. 
You know, you go into another door and it's the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, I would try to do as much as possible. Could you imagine, realistically, if you were to jump into a pile of coins? Oh, it hurt. Every body, every bone in your body would be broken. Well, from high every enough, that's true about anything, isn't it? What if they were chocolate coins? You could what if we, no, what if they were you lighter could jump, coins? You could jump from four feet and you would break a bone. <laughs> A it hurt. Pile of coins. <laughs> it's not like jumping off a bridge and all of a sudden water is like cement. I mean, it's it's a stack of coins. I appreciate your your dedication to reality, uh, but will... in the oasis, <laughs> but in the oasis, planets can be small or big, and the gravity doesn't matter. So you want it to be you want it to be like coin like water. But this yes. hideout is not in the oasis. But yeah, but right. It's, you know, it's, it's still it's still. It it's, still follows the same the same rules. The same though, rules. Well, I mean, you could then you can do the anti gravity. I mean, it's, it's a, you could you could adjust a, the laws of physics for uh, for your hideout, couldn't you? Right. Yeah. So sure. coins don't hurt when you when you jump into. Them. <laughs> <laughs> Problem I'm solved. I'm glad we. I'm 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 really glad we cleared that up. I'm turning off that part of the haptic, the part that I'm hurts me. Super glad we we cleared that up. <laughs> Mine is definitely going to be the cabin. Uh, the grandfather's cabin from the Lost Boys. I'm sticking with it. I don't yeah, know why. Just it, it's just it's a movie from my childhood that I absolutely loved, and it's kind of what got me into horror movies. But that there was something about that cabin with all the taxidermy and stuff. It was just weird, but kind of cool at the same time. I would do that if it was the post vampire fight where the car has been driven through the front door. And the vampire is like punctured through one of the the deer heads hung on the wall, you know, <laughs> kind of like a post vampire fight. That's what you come into. Like, what happened here? Utter disaster and chaos. We defeated vampires. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah. we're just hanging out, so, partying yeah, a little. So, hey, you guys want to come and you guys want to come and watch a movie? It's in complete disarray and chaos <laughs> at all times. It's but, a crime uh, scene. It's a good at place to watch some John Hughes, some Savage <laughs> so it's Steve like Holland. The, it's like the club from from Dust Till Dawn. At the end of the movie, <laughs> basically. Well, no, it's a little homey. <gasps> that would, and be that's great what I like about too. it. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, the club from dusk till dawn. That'd be with a good video one. games, with like arcades in the nooks and crannies, right? And Selma Hayek, and and Cheech Marin. I would have like a cyborg version of the Frog Brothers, of Corey Haim and Corey Feldman. <laughs> They're just like <laughs> what? Who, they're were like, they're acting as robotic? Yeah, Are you I'm sure not, that I'm not a... picking up my Intellivision controller. <laughs> Corey Feldman's doing that for me. <laughs> Corey, remote now. Okay, yeah. man. <laughs> so, at any rate, those are our basements. And now, uh, Wade mentions at this point in the chapter that the basement is a standalone simulation existing outside of the oasis. Uh, he also mentions that for this reason, his avatar can be in two places at once because he's in his classroom on Ludus, but he's also in H's basement. But in reality, he's in a fucking van <laughs> at the bottom of the stacks. Down by the stacks. Down by the <laughs> stacks. Like, I, I don't get... Like, here's the thing. If you're already in a simulation, how, why why draw that distinction of being two places at once? Well, look, here's the thing, right? Uh, if you are in a simulation, if you're in your chair, in a simulation, in a simulation within a simulation, in order for you to come out of the second level simulation, you've got to set up a kick. And to do that, you've got to make it so that your chair is unbalanced in some way, so that at a certain time it falls back, and it's that feeling of falling that actually kicks you out of the second level and brings you up to the first level then you got to plan another kick that then brings you back into reality and wakes you up or you could carry a fucking top in your pocket pretty much and call that a totem <laughs> so the movie inception yeah, yeah. so it's the basically book is way longer for this chapter but you wouldn't know it well here's the thing like i i think you brought up before chris when we were talking about show notes is that you're you're in the classroom and you bring up a a separate window it's to where you can kind of move the classroom up to a corner window, right? And then yeah. and then move about H's basement in that virtual reality space. 
So yeah. that you're still kind of there. Your avatar is there, but it's also at the same time here. I don't think that's going to be too weird because you're already able to bring up uh, the internet on a browser in front of you and float it in front of your face and potentially share it with somebody. Uh, having a pip kind of floating off to the side shouldn't be a big deal. Like, you know, I, I wouldn't imagine that being uh, too strange. Here's my trick question, Aguado. If... <laughs> <laughs> fucking call me a guado if, if i'm in if i'm in the classroom right and i'm in h's basement i'm in i'm in two places at once at least within the oasis right mm. say that i am in in the classroom and i'm in a pvp well say i'm not in the classroom say i'm in a pvp zone right Okay. And and then I go to a chat room, and I get killed in my PvP zone. That's I my that's, jumping off point. I Do I die in both spaces? I... <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, if if you die, then you're you're lost in the chat room for eons. <laughs> Never. Well, shit. That's uh, not a bad place to be. Uh, no, it's not. Not a bad. Especially place to if lost. it's the granddad's cabin from uh, from Lost Boys. I'll take that. But he's still aware that he's in the Oasis and I'm then in the chat room. You know? I and, 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 uh, This might be a flaw of mine. I'm going a little deeper into the book by saying this. Mm -hmm. But you also know that like, if, if, if your character gets wiped out, right? Say that like my spawn point was you know, this PvP zone. And then H calls me up and he's like, Hola, compadre, whatever the fuck. And I you know, go into his basement... And I'm watching, you know, fucking Better Off Dead, you know, playing some Atari, and then some some dude comes up and just slices me. Do I immediately leave the chat room and I'm just done? Oh, are you talking about like if you get killed while you're right. in the chat room? Right. That thought kind of crossed my mind a moment ago. Uh, well, like you know, what would ha yeah, if you, yeah, if you decided to zone out, you would you still be in the chat room or would your little pip go? You're dead. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> which <laughs> game over? <laughs> I guess which which presence takes priority, right? Yeah. You would think it would be the spawn point, right? That you know the point where you you spawned in. That uh, that that would be the point where it, it would determine whether or not your character was 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 killed or not. I'd go on. I would go on. I I'd, I'd be willing to say that the the since the chat room is a separate place that is hosted independent of the oasis. That you are just connecting, if you will. You're VPing into a, another system. You're you're remoting in, if you will. Which is not much different than that. Like you could be online at home and VPN and remote into something else. So if you were killed in the Oasis, you'd probably still be in the chat room. Like your your persona that you carried with you would still be in the chat room. You might have so to change safe. that up at some point. Yeah, you're, I think you're safe. I wouldn't say safe. But I'd say that that it's so separate enough that who you are in the chat room is a separate entity of yourself than what's in the Oasis. And the Oasis is really the thing that's in trouble. The thing that's in the chat room is just, you know, you could be kicked out and somebody could ban so, you. I don't well, mean to I don't mean to press this point, but that's that's what the podcast was kind of made for. Is these little it. Con, these little conundrums. But if Okay, so if if I can spawn myself in several different instances, or let's at see, let's at least say that it's two, right? Um, sure. If if I'm in if I'm in a pickle or I'm going into a tough situation, if he's in a pickle, can I not like spawn into the chat room, which is completely safe? No, go you're on not, to you're not spawning into it. You're just opening it up. You're entering it, if you will. Okay. There is no escaping in that sense. And in fact, I'm pretty sure you can't just drop out of the Oasis as a means of escaping PvP. But 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 you're you're insinuating that you can though. Because if I like say that I'm in a PvP zone and then I go into a chat room and my body or my avatar is still in the PvP zone and I come up and I just I get hacked up that doesn't matter. I'm imagining if you're on a if you're doing a PvP game, okay, mm -hmm. you're playing 
Call of Duty, Battlefield, whatever. And you can still chat while you're playing. So it doesn't matter if you die or not. You can still chat with the other players on your team, or if it's open, you can put chat with everybody else. Even it's separate from what you're actually doing on the map. Yeah, okay. and if he's playing first-person shooter stuff, uh, and then he's potentially either in the Oasis playing first-person shooter where he's experiencing dying and respawning, which mm -hmm. is a different kind of character death or different death altogether. It doesn't really count. It's competitive. Uh, I, I got to imagine that, that that even if somebody was able to kill you in their chat room, if they had that feature turned on, that it's separate enough from the Oasis, it, it, it doesn't count. It's not the same. But your primary existence is in the chat room at this point primary existence so okay so i i exist in my classroom right right and i shut my eyes i did a little shut eye thing and then mm -hmm. i I'm, I'm i'm actually in the chat room right say the classroom were a pvp zone somebody comes and chops off my head mm -hmm. and i'm sitting here in the chat room do i completely mm -hmm. dissolve from the chat room at that point i say you stay in the chat room you respawn wherever okay. your spawn point is well, yeah. in the case, in the case of H's basement, that doesn't really fucking matter <laughs> because you happen to be in the presence of one of the finest PvP players in all of the Oasis. That's H. Uh, not only is he one of the finest PvP players in the Oasis, he also happens to be one of the most well-respected gunters in the Oasis. Kind of a bit of luck that Wade even found this guy, right? Yeah, well, you'd, you'd figure that if you had two people that are really deep into the topic and they're they're visiting the same areas like they were, that they'd eventually either gravitate to each other, or uh, or really hate each other. And it's it's interesting in this context, the context of you know this competition, um, you know, for the egg. Uh, they both have an obsession. Uh, for finding this thing and they do their research together they're aligned but at the same time they're very guarded from one another which i understand i mean if 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 you're going to be setting out on on finding a billion dollar treasure or 240 or whatever it is billion dollar treasure i can see the benefit of of meeting like-minded people who can kind of help you along the way or keep you interested or whatever but also how that could be a liability, right? And we don't really know at this point in the book whether it's one or the other. John, how do you feel about it? Like, like your first time reading the book, do you see, you know, as as far as the hunt goes, do you see H as a liability or a help? Uh, I think they help each other. They kind of hone each other's skills. It's almost as if they, they both, the, the goal is the same for both of them. They respect each other, mm -hmm. and they train with each other. They don't share the secrets with one of one another, but they train each other and push each other to be the best that they can be. So it's like Apollo and Rocky. Yes. Who's <laughs> who's who? Rocky who's is who? Wade. Wade is Rocky. Wade is clearly fucking Rocky, yeah. here, man. Yeah. Well, wait a second. Hold on. Why is Wade Rocky? <laughs> oh, come on, you contrarian bastard. Well, I'm, I'm just saying, what, what is, is it? Rocky. Well, let me flip this. Why is it that in what ways are, are, are H and Apollo similar? Successful. Accomplished. Established. Proven. Okay. <laughs> Shall we All go right. on? Wade's from the fucking streets. <laughs> yeah. All right. Or, <laughs> I could draw a million correlations now that I think about it. Now that you've challenged me on this point, I can I can draw a million parallel lines but between you can't, Rocky and Parzival. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be hard. Are you saying there's some lines you can't draw right now? What do you mean? Do you have any examples <laughs> of why they would be the opposite? Yeah. No, actually. Uh... <laughs> Being an asshole. Uh, 
I can see why they'd be the same because Apollo is established. Rocky is the underdog. He is he's coming from the streets from some degree of poverty. Uh, he has to work harder. Has to be hungry. And I really like the idea that 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 you've got these two fighters and they're really fighting for the egg. And they don't they don't give up to each other. They don't they don't give in to each other. In this case, the battle is over information and and searching for the treasure, if you will. Mm-hmm. And and they're not going to give each other they're not gonna let each other see each other's maps. Because that's insulting. That mm-hmm. in, in when you're competing at a level of like intelligence, to actually offer up is to say you don't have enough. If I mm-hmm. give you a hint, it's because you could take that as you didn't think I could do it on my own. So for for them to give anything to each other would be a sign of disrespect. It would be insulting. And they know that. And they know that. Uh, that that they have to be rely on themselves and that's where their respect is rooted. And that's highlighted that's highlighted in the chapter uh, when we get to the point where Wade's talking about you know, not accepting help from H, even though he knows that H can kind of pay his way. He knows that H is headed to places w- that would benefit him in terms of, you know, racking up experience points, and things like that. He doesn't ever take that. And more importantly, um, I think when you get a little farther down the page here, you know, H doesn't offer or even really talk about what he was doing the night before. Because he's not trying to rub it in. Mm-hmm. And that's 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 a good little comparison point. Like not only does he not offer him help, he doesn't offer him help, but he also doesn't rub in the fact that he was, you know, out gaining experience points or doing these other things. Yeah. It, it kind of gives you an idea of what their relationship is actually like. But before yeah. he reaches age, before he reaches age, sprawled out in the middle of the couch, Wade makes his way through a sea of freaks or avatars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say freaks. You can say avatars, whatever. Um, it's a cornucopia of avatars. Um, there's humans, cyborgs, demons, dark elves, Vulcans, and vampires, and probably just about every other thing or species you could find in a video game. Dude, it's like going to Dragon Con. It's like going to Dragon Con. Oh, Yeah. I love that. Or 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 Moss Eisley. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's going to the cantina, man. That's exactly what I had in my mind. Wait a second. There were vampires in the cantina? There was one guy that kind of looked like a vampire. No, I think he was just emo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of emo, we've got Duran Duran's Wild Boys playing in the back. <laughs> <sighs> I can't believe I've got to defend this again. <laughs> well, I can't believe you're gonna try. I, I mean, didn't, I didn't know you were on the defensive uh, over it. I feel I just like thought I you were explaining your 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 point of view when it comes to Duran Duran. Guys, if it wasn't clear, <laughs> listeners out there in the audience, if it wasn't clear, Chris <laughs> is a massive fan. No, no, no. I wouldn't Duran say Duran. massive. <laughs> do you still see I them in say... concert? I so do. My my, my wife fan. is a massive fan. Oh, I'm more okay. converted. Cop out. To well, call me a Durani would be unfair to the true Durannies out there. First off, let's <laughs> okay. just lay that out there. Why Durani? I did not make up the term. But who mm. did? It's an awful one. It is pretty bad. How about it? Like the DDs. Would that's, be better. That is a thing too. Uh, oh really? That that's one of their symbols, right? Hold on. What about the Duranimals? Oh God. How about that? Dur- that no, sounds like the, uh, the Durani. No, that just sounds like a huh? like a. Isn't there That's... another play on on that? How no, about this? That... How about the D heads? I'm s- no. The D no. bags. No, oh, just... the D bags. <laughs> the D bag clan. You guys are horrible. That's just not right. A wash of of Reddit Durannies are gonna come after you guys. <laughs> I I shit you not. Every year that they produce an album and we go and catch them in concert, they sell out. <laughs> I mean, the, I, do, I believe it's that not, it's not hard to sell out a fifty a fifty seat arena. You oh. know, <laughs> <laughs> thousands, fifty seats, John. Is it an thousands. arena? Yeah. Is it an arena or is, or is it a community seats, center? Sorry. Is it a community center or an arena? <laughs> well, they call it an arena. Is it a okay. state it's fair? The, no, it is not it's that. The, uh, it's the Eagles Lodge Arena. <laughs> 
they still sound fantastic. They probably and do. I, and I was, I was I'm not, sure. uh, I was not converted until my wife had me go with her. To the got BFW. tickets, and I was like, you know what? I'll just go with you because I'm, I'll be, you know, I'm familiar with the music. Who isn't? And they were. It's not like those bands that are kind of like twenty years later. They're like, I think I still know how to play my bass, and I need some money. Let's get the band back together. And you know their voices are horrible, and they haven't practiced, and they're not getting their notes, and you can tell that their best shit was when they were drunk and high, and they're well <laughs> past that now. No, that is not these guys. Like you'll go and you go, holy shit, they sound better than their CDs. That they but they have not stopped. It, they are freaking awesome. Okay, I'll check them out when they play at the <laughs> Moose Lodge down the street. <laughs> That that. <laughs> so what? So what you're saying is, if I go see them live, they're gonna sound way better than what I've heard on CDs. <laughs> that doesn't seem hard. <laughs> they were innovative for their time. All right. They pra- They practically ruled M- M- MTV for a good ten years. 10 years. Oh yeah. They they dominated MTV I'm not saying, as far as videos look, from I'm the core of the, the 80s. I'm not going to be a dipshit about this. I mean, Duran Duran was a seminal part of the 80s. They wouldn't have made it into the book if they hadn't been. You're I just mean, saying you're not a fan. I'm not a fan now. Well, no. you know, it was a little before your time a bit. But anyways, got ourselves a group of avatars here representing every species that has ever existed in science fiction or otherwise. Maybe even some species we don't know about yet. So it begs the question, if you were to create an avatar tomorrow or today or whatever, what would your avatar look like? If it was not what we had talked about before, like like out there. It doesn't matter. I mean, like, I mean. No, it matters because you can't be Han Solo now. Yeah, you can't be. Yeah, you can't, can't be, Harrison, be Ford. Harrison Ford, and I can't this be. This is Sean the fucking Donnelly. oasis. I could be whatever I want. Well, we're just saying, you know, we, 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 we're, this is different from the last podcast. You're talking about Moss Eisley's bar, Han Solo's taken. Who are you gonna be? I'm not gonna be fucking Greedo. That's for sure. <laughs> um, I might be Greedo with like a bandaid on my chest. <laughs> Just to throw people off. <laughs> just I survived. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he shot first, but he fucking missed. <laughs> that would be like a, that'd be like on a button on the other side of my chest. I survived the Han. <laughs> Han Solo, quick shooter, bad aim. I would set my avatar up to look like uh, a chimp from. The original Planet of the Apes. I've always wanted that costume. Like, legit makeup. <laughs> legit Doom Dirty Ape. Okay. Yeah. You're going to shoot <laughs> me for this, John, but I would probably be my car- my, my avatar from Destiny. Hmm. Awoken Male Warlock. Yeah, that sounds original. Chris, what about Boom. you? <laughs> I actually created it, motherfucker. Although I've run into several instances that look a lot like my character. Yeah, you only it have two species to point. choose from. It's not like there aren't many options when you when you set up your character in Destiny. I'm, su- don't I'm assuming... Ins- don't, don't insult it. Why do you oh, always not... have to insult it? No, I'm not. I'm assuming it's, it's Destiny 2, which was just... Uh, the trailer was just released recently. Looks fucking uh, fantastic. I'm assuming Destiny 2 will... Will increase those options. You'll notice he's fine to piss all over Duran Duran, but another D word, oh, and he's just yeah. all defensive. Destiny. Why does it have to be called Destiny? <laughs> <laughs> Why Duran? Sh- Why Destiny? I'm not shitting over Destiny. I'm just. Uh, I I just I the customizing your your avatar in Destiny was a little limited. I don't I, I don't disagree with that. You were looking for a beard is what you were looking for. No, I just didn't want to be blue. <laughs> well, like, you don't have to be, be blue, blue dude. Guy. <laughs> don't be an awoken or be a human. Yeah. Or an exo. Chris, what about you? That's like a cyborg. 
Uh, well, you know, it doesn't have to be like this this full fledged animated thing, right? So I'm thinking maybe like uh, you gonna be claymation? Kinda. I, I'm thinking Pip Boy from Fallout. Mr. Bill. Ooh. Pip Boy. Oh, the, the ball blue boy. jumpsuit. Yeah, yeah. Ball Boy. Pip Boy. Ball, ball Boy, boy okay. with the with the blonde hair. Maybe every day I have a slightly different outfit based on whatever drug or 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 skill I'm pimping, you know, like with weights or electro gun or whatever it is. But he's got that cheesy ass smile. I'm, but I'm a little jealous. Like a, yeah, Vault Boy. I'm thinking would be like a, cool a 3D one. version of Vault Boy, right? Blue jumpsuit, yeah. blonde hair, the smile, the eyes, right out of the 50s. That's pretty badass. That's, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a really good one. But he'd have well, a really he'd have a really gravelly voice though. Slightly right. weathered. <laughs> <laughs> he, Son of I've a seen bitch. some shit. I've eaten other humans. <laughs> but now we move on to the couch where H is sprawled out with his signature Cheshire grin, waiting on Wade to say, Sup, Z. Z is what he calls Parsifal for short. Sprawled out across the couch. It's yeah, it's Sup, it's Z. a real uh it's a real close relationship, these two. Come have. sit next to um, me. <laughs> I don't think there's anything going on like that. But, I, I know there's not. I know there's not. It would be in the but, book, or maybe it wouldn't. You you made this point. This was this is bo- this part was born out of a conversation between Chris and I, when we were talking about what we thought, you know, H looked like when we first read the book. Uh, yeah, I I read the book the first couple times through. Uh, Chris, you were introduced to the book through audiobooks, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. so your your first, you know, when you pictured H for the first time, what did you see him at? Well, as as uh, Will Wheaton was reading the dialogue to me before Betty by time, <laughs> I imagined I imagined H as this sort of blonde haired, uh, uh, you know, sort of surfer guy, maybe sort of California esque kind of thing, like you know, Spicoli. whoa, amigo, welcome, <laughs> Spicoli. Dude, look at the time. It's the eighties. Like we've got the Duranas. It so it's maybe something right out of like Bill and Ted with the blonde guy that didn't go nearly as far as the dark haired guy in his career. Spicoli. Actually, you know what? Actually, he ended up no, not Spicoli. Darn it! Uh, it's Spicoli. No, it's not Spicoli. It's yeah. it's uh, which one is it? Is it is it is it? Bill or Ted? Which one's the blonde guy? Dude, no, that would be. That's uh... Bill S. Preston Esquire, sir. Oh, is that the blonde-haired one? Yes. Yes. Because he did end up as a vampire in Lost Boys and killed in the room that you want to do your thing in. Wait, no, he didn't die in that room. He died in the cave. Shit, yeah, he did. Oh, they got him in the cave. Mm-hmm. Oh well, what do you do? <laughs> he was the only one. I think the only one to die in the cave. Oh, he was in the same damn movie. Bill All right, it worked S. out. It was close. He's just down S. the road. <laughs> Anyhow, that's what I imagined. But sure, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe Spicoli, maybe, kind of. It's definitely uh, Spicoli. Mostly. Mostly. It's mostly Spicoli. Mostly. See, I, I okay, so here's how I pictured H. I, I picture him as almost being like a, a suited guy. You know, very, very metrosexual. Just just kind of the, you know, the man's man, bro kind of guy. In a suit? Yeah. Like a, just a like, you know, hair dude. slicked back, just like, hey, compadre. You know, just like real cool. Dude, bro. Like, I, I did, that was what I just, for some reason, I pictured that. Did you get that reading it, John? You know, I, to put uh, a face to him and i guess mannerisms uh i kind of pictured a paul rudd type character Mm -hmm. that's how that's how he seemed like likable but could say like the cheesiest things or the dumbest things and it's still kind of still kind of funny yeah yeah when you say like like suave suit i'm thinking like christian bale and American Psycho or something like (laughs) i don't i don't know why that's the first association you make come sit on my couch and let me tell you about my favorite artist. <laughs> Come sit on my joystick. That is not who I had in mind. I might add when I when I was thinking age. It was not. But, it was, it was but not that's how Patrick it was read Bateman. to me, though. That's how. It, that's how when when Will Wheaton was sitting by my either. bed, and and he was voicing 
H's voice, and that's that's what I fell asleep to is is a blonde haired sort of surfer guy. Okay, I get it. Okay, so um, we hang out in the basement playing some uh, some classic two player games. Contra, fucking love that game when I was a kid. Golden Axe, another one I loved. Heavy Barrel, did not play Heavy Barrel. I didn't um, play Heavy Barrel. Smash TV, no. Ikari, Ikari Warriors, I believe I did play that game. I remember Ikari Warriors, and I remember Contra. But I remember Contra because it was one of those few games where you could run forward and your arm turned independently. Like, you could move forward and fire up and down, so you could create this really cool kind of spray effect. I believe that game was also the birth of one of our... One of the most common tropes in all video games, was it not? I I don't know. The Konami code. Uh, what the up down up down left right left right A B A B whatever it, mm-hmm. something along those lines maybe. Mm-hmm. I I don't know if that was yeah it might have been. Hmm. I think it might have been. If anybody out there listening knows the origin of the Konami the Konami. Konoma- <laughs> The Konami Code. <laughs> the Konami Kino- 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 And if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong that the Konami Code is is began with Contra, let me know. Call me an asshole. I can take it. Um, <laughs> at this point, <laughs> at this point, H and Parzival engage in a little uh, verbal fisticuffs um, about the movie Lady Hawk, and the uh, the Ewok movies and Endor- the Endorians. I gotta admit there, there are a few there are a few points in the book where I get through a couple of pages and I look back and I'm like why I I think that like <laughs> this is each one like when you really dig into the source material you're gonna if you know a lot about the source material there's the obvious stuff and then there's mm-hmm. the sort of eccentric stuff. And I think, like, this is their sort of fetish-level addiction or liking. You know, mm-hmm. like, their guilty pleasures. But they may even be, like, denying that it is a guilty pleasure and trying to defend that guilty pleasure. Like, I have every right to love Lady Hawk because that was a classic. And, of course, that it's kind of like, bullshit, that's a classic. And then you, boom, barrel into all of the, 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 the barbary between the two of them as to how it's not and... It pitches back to the, the Ewoks or the Andorians that these are their guilty pleasures and and they're proud of their guilty pleasures and they will defend it and rationalize it into the ground with each other. But you know that's what cool friends do. Yeah, you get a you get an insight into a little more of their relationship with the back and forth over these guilty pleasures that they have. So let's let's I, I just want to like just just to. A little get to know you section of the uh, the podcast here. What is your guilty pleasure? It could be a muse, uh, a band. A, it could be a music. It could be oh. a band, a movie. One of those two. Ryan, you can go first. I'll go this first. Time. Dancing Queen by ABBA. Turn it up every fucking time it's on. Huge fan. That's a good one. Mine's going to be music as well. Cindy Lauper. Girls just want to have fun. It's a good song. <laughs> that's actually that's a good song. Why. Really? Yeah. How did you feel about Shebop? It's not bad. You, do you know it's what the like song the is about? It's like the Duran Duran of Cindy Lauper songs. <laughs> <laughs> have, have, you, have you read the lyrics to Shebop, just out of curiosity? No. No. That song's about female <laughs> masturbation. Oh, really? The next time, listen to the lyrics, but that is what the song is about. My guilty pleasure is Dancing Queen by ABBA. John's is Girls Just Want to Have Fun, which sounds a little more about the subject matter. <laughs> <laughs> but yours is, well, Ro- yours is the Cindy Lauper about the little man in the canoe. No, no, that's not my guilty pleasure. Okay, I do like the song. 
I like that sort of Easter egg they snuck into your pop music that you're giving as a kid. You're singing. She it's nice. Doo -bop, doo -bop, it's good. You're singing it word for word, and it's you don't even realize what it is that she's going on about. Mm -hmm. Or I, I say you, but it was really me. Because when I started reading the lyrics, I'm like, oh, my God. I sang this as a child. Uh, the thing. <laughs> the thing that, that people do. Uh, okay, so guilty pleasure. Uh, if it was music, I'd say Justin Timberlake. That is a cop-out, man. Is because, it? Like, here's the... Yes. Dude, I'm here, 43. Here's why. How Here's is that a cop out at 43? John and I are probably two of the biggest music pricks you could run into. Uh -huh. And I don't think you could get either of us to say, yeah, Justin Timberlake's completely fucking untalented. <gasps> no, I never said he was untalented. I'm just saying that it's just, you know, would be unusual. Well, I mean, it would be hard it would be hard for either of us to say that we didn't enjoy some of his music sometimes. Well, it's yeah, it's I cuz he's I just don't mind good. I don't mind Timberlake being on. Yeah, I this think is, so for this you guys, is it's just... this is something like you are you're driving down yeah. the road and you've got your windows down and you don't want to do it. You don't want to turn the, mo the but volume you're gonna up, fucking do but it. you're going to do it. And you're going to hope that nobody's walking down the street. Yeah. Dance like nobody's watching, Chris. That's not right. Timberlake. Who is it? Digital Underground Humpty Dance. I know all the lyrics to that song. Front to again. Back. And a what? Again? You guys are like, that's not a guilty pleasure. That's just it's a pleasure, not. man. Come on. It's not. Everybody Dude, fucking has that at a party mix at least once in their I life. Am a, I am a 42-year-old white guy that knows the Humpty Dance from back <sighs> to front. Yeah, but... <laughs> okay, fine. Fine. Movies, then. Well, we can pick from movies, Go for right? It. Go for it. Did you guys like... Um... Because that's really what it's going to come down to. Is I'm going to say, did you like this? And if you don't like it, it will then be a guilty pleasure. Okay. All right. Moulin Rouge. Absolutely okay. gets me in the feels. I sure. mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I like how they kind of redid the music. It kind of spoke to my era. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love the actors in that movie. And uh, it's just one of those. It's kind of like, oh, that was wonderful. <sighs> okay. I gotta go wipe my face. It feels moist. I'll accept that one. <laughs> it's a respect. It's a respectable movie, but I'll still accept that as a guilty pleasure. Sure. All right. All right. We're 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 getting we're getting sidetracked. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, let's stay on we're track. We're all feeling here. guilty. Guilty all pleasures. Right. So, the battle continues between H and Parzival over stupid shit that doesn't matter, and in walks. One of my favorite characters in the book. I think I say that about every new character, but, you know, you can call me full of shit if you want. But in walks Irock. Now. <laughs> in walks T.J. Miller. This In walks T.J. Miller, basically. John? <laughs> yeah. That's... You, you, had a, you, had a good, you had a good thought on this. This is the first, you know, obviously it's the first time you're reading the book. And you knew T.J. Miller was going to be in the movie, right? I knew he was cast in the movie. I didn't know who he was cast as. But as soon as I read IROC, I knew for a fact that that was T.J. Miller. And it just made it so much better. You know, I was thinking about this last night, and... I had told you guys that I had always imagined it being T.J. Miller. But that is wrong. I do, I have this bad habit when I read books to, like, put somebody in a role. Like, I, I just, like, I automatically imagine somebody playing that character. And the first time I read through this book, the person that I imagined being Irock was uh, Justin Long. Mm, same kind of humor. Because I think I had I just guess. seen Sasquatch Gang. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty good. And I mean, like, even if you do, like, um, Brandon St. Randy, just like, like you're doing a mix between those two guys <laughs> and apply that to IROC, it would be fucking hilarious. Yeah. And, but, but, I will say this. 
I've become a little more aware of TJ Miller since 2011. And it's impossible for me now to imagine anybody but TJ Miller being IROC. Yeah, I'll concede to that. Because he's so yeah. fucking perfect. Yeah, he is. He really is. Part and parcel. Just perfect. All right. So we meet IROC. IROC uh, interrupts the argument that Wade and uh, that that Wade and H are having um, over Lady Hawk and and the Endorians, the Ewoks. H and uh, Parzival have been going back and forth with one another, and there's a little bit of tension. You get a little bit of tension when you're reading this part of the chapter because, you know, H is this uh, this this very accomplished Gunter. He's this very accomplished uh, PVP. Uh, personality within the Oasis. He's, you know, in his own right, quite famous. Parzival is a level three, as he describes himself, nobody. Nobody knows who the fuck he is. And here he is in the middle of, of H's own, you know, own basement chat room, going back and forth with the guy. Now, that takes some balls. <laughs> He's like that asshole that shows up to a party and just tries to own the room right from the get-go by being a complete dick. Yeah, but (laughs) they do it well because they're, you know, it's 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 like the three of us kind of going back and forth on our guilty pleasures. You know what I mean? And getting ribbing each other. We could go back and forth like that, but there's really no animosity to it. Now, the moment Irock shows up and starts asserting his fucking bullshit, everybody in the room shows up to the fight. And do you know why? Because Iraq is an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> he draws Mainly. that kind of attention. It is. It's it's that shit's gonna go down attention. Yeah. That can only be present when an asshole is present. <laughs> 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 so so Iraq shows up. This is a really important part of the chapter for me. Because it really shows you, it, it contrasts the argument that H and Parzival are having with the converse, you know, the, the argument that Parzival and Iraq are having, right? I mean, there's a huge difference between H, uh, H and Parzival and Iraq and Parzival here. There's no animosity between H and Parzival. There's a lot of animosity mm-hmm. between Iraq and Parzival. A lot of that is born out of the fact that Iraq is a fucking dickhead, uh, allowed Parzival to take a, a ride with him to, uh, to Greyhawk to kill some kobolds, gain some XP, followed him around and recorded him, killing low-level characters and superimposing the words Penisville, the mighty kobold slayer on the screen and broadcasting that out to the Oasis That's like shitty. a dick. That's shitty. It really is shitty. You know, it's it's like it's like it's like spying on somebody at school while they're getting dressed, like through the bathroom window or some shit, and then taking pictures and making fun of them. It's just, it's some meatballs it, shit. It, it's mean. It's just mean. <laughs> yeah, I don't disagree with that. That's that's. I mean, as much as I love I Rock as a character, just for the comic relief of him. I mean, if I were in high school with this kid, I would have fucking hated him. Yeah, it's funny well, to read on the outside, but putting yourself in that basement, it'd be easy to very much dislike Iraq. It would be almost impossible to like him. In yeah. fact. <laughs> so Iraq decides to challenge Wade and the rest of the Gunters in the room, essentially, with a um, with a Gunter question or a Gunter challenge on the uh, the history. Of the Atari game Sword Quest Earthworld. This is not a game that I played. I have not played it, but you know it's no. it's pretty far back for me. Okay, I didn't play it either. But uh, one of the things that we were kind of discussing in show notes is that this is a really good, just from the description that you get here and what we were able to find online. This is a really good uh, tie-in to the remainder of of the book or, or just to the spirit of the contest, because you've got adventure being, you know, sort of the birth of the, uh, the interest in the thought of an Easter egg. Right. Um, 
with Warren Robinette hiding his his name within Adventure. Well, Sword Quest, as it's brought up in this chapter, is a sequel to Adventure. Now, the reason that's sort of important is if you consider the fact that Atari never knew that Warren Robinette's name was in Adventure, but there was a little bit of a cult following for Adventure just because of the Easter egg, just because it was something interesting. It was sort of, you know, the earliest version of an achievement that you could get in the video game to to find it. Um, it kind of molded the contest that they talk about here with Sword Quest. And I find it really interesting that they don't really talk about Sword Quest as a game as much as they do the sort of ARG or, you know, reality um, blending with game kind of aspect of Sword Quest, that you could you could achieve things in the game and actually win things in real life. And if you can imagine how things would have changed in the book, like you talk about like a one pivotal moment, one pivotal thing. If, if Anorak had not, or Halliday had not found that Easter egg, he would not have been inspired to do everything forward from that. But that was like that moment of pivot that there's such a very small contribution of identity uh, that is, and let's let's face it, what this book is, is is the life and times of of the the geek esoteric. It is the it is the hunt for unusual, rare, and and secretive information that you collect and store for the hopes of transforming that into something that will gain you power. And an Easter egg is just that. It is the hidden es esoteric knowledge that somebody else is giving to you if you have the right talent to find it. I mean, when you get right down to what, like, the, the geek occult is, that's this book in totality. And here you have these sort of mages that are collecting occult knowledge in order to eventually gain them mastery power over this universe that is the Oasis. And, and just to boil it all down to a handful of games where they decided to hide a couple nuggets of information and this idea that, oh my gosh, somebody individual had the power to sneak something in and that that speaks directly to you. You know, it's almost like that person's reaching out of that game and presenting themselves to you in a way that maybe no one else has ever seen. Mm -hmm. And I kind of dig that because there are instances of that in larger scale as we move through the book. And I'm going to stay at that really vague level there. Yeah, please mm -hmm. do. But uh, I, 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 am, <laughs> I am. But I just I think it's I think it's neat. It kind of reflects back onto that that sort of primary moment that, that dr drives the entire book. So one thing that is clear out of the back end of this conversation is that IROC is not on the same level as H or, or Parzival. The two of them really do stand out in a room of Gunters and probably, you know, throughout Gunter culture. Uh, they've really immersed themselves into the Oasis and into Halliday's, uh, Halliday's contest. Uh, you get a really good picture of that here, just like Chris said. Um, but at this point, the school bell rings, the three-minute bell rings, and the Gunters begin to recede off to their own classrooms. We get a really good sort of snapshot of H and Parzival here. Um, when kind of talking about IROC, where... Wade asks, why in the fuck do you let this guy hang out here? <laughs> and it's a good question. <laughs> when you're first reading the book and you don't get to, to, to H's follow-up to this question, it's a really good question because it's like, yeah, why the fuck would you let this guy hang out here? But H says something that's actually sort of profound here, uh, that it's a reminder to us as Gunters that this is our competition. And as long as it is our competition we have a really good chance of actually finding this thing. So, so that's the hope. IROC is like their, 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 their Gunter wingman. Sort of. Wingman? Yeah. 
wingman in the sense that you bring a wingman to come with you and that person's going to naturally look slightly less attractive than you on purpose <laughs> so that when given the option you, you are know, the John, natural just like choice I was for you in high among... school <laughs> just like what <laughs> just like i you... was for you in high school oh i don't i, I don't know about that <laughs> i wasn't uh, but need you need that comparison that. Uh, you need yeah. that reminder, I guess, that, that you're better. And on top of that, they laid the smack down. And from a from a book perspective, IROC like, plays a really pivotal role in solidifying the relationship between H and Parsifal. Yeah, I think so. It, it's, it's a really important part of this chapter. You, you'd um, not, even if they, they had the earlier stuff, I don't think you would have nearly as much depth Right. And how they work together if you didn't have this common adversary this early in the book. Well, in, in this, this co like I said before, it's, it's this contrast between the type of argument that you can have with a friend and the type of argument that you're bound to have with a fucking prick. Mm -hmm. You know, just it, there's there's a difference. You know, there's there's one that's caustic. Like there there are I guess this is the best way to say it. There are arguments that are made to to help you kind of grow or that are more of a conversation, even if they tend to be a little caustic sometimes. And then there are arguments that are made to just tear somebody down. And that's, that's what, that's what I rock represents. Yeah. I rock is not banter. So H H invites at this point, H invites, uh, H invites Parsifal back down to the basement to watch a spaced marathon. Now spaced is a movie that didn't, or movie. Spaced is a, uh, a TV television series. series that did not happen in the 80s. Instead, it happened in the late 90s, 99 to 2001, actually. Uh, but it is pretty much um, a mirror image of what's going on in the basement right yeah, now. Yeah, it seemed fitting. Two kind of opposites, playing video games, pop culture references, etc. Yeah. yeah. If I had to imagine, kind of like the relationship that 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 H and Parsifal have, it would be that Simon Pegg and Nick Frost relationship. Yeah, you know where they can, you know, you see them on the couch, uh, you know, getting over a hangover with uh, those ice cream cones, <laughs> but uh, and playing video games uh, and having an occasional argument about something completely stupid. But again, mm -hmm. it's not an argument. It's it's more of a, a banter, and they know it's stupid, but they get kind of serious about it. And it's just there's that that balance that's just funny as hell. And to say, hey, let's let's go down to the basement and let's watch these two goofs that basically sit around, play games, and riff on '80s references. It's very reflective of what these two are like. Yeah, that their 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 common interest is is in the reflection of themselves in this these characters in space. I think. Definitely. Yeah. And we've got a hell of a lot more of that to come. Not to give up too much for you, John. I know Between more stuff H and coming. Parzival <laughs> as, the, as the book progresses. But for now, it's time to go to class, and it's time to end Chapter 3. So, thanks a lot, again, for joining us for another chapter of Ready Player One. I'm Ryan. I'm John. I'm Chris. And that's the show. Thanks again for coming. So long, everyone. You think Bruce Wills would give you a hug? I could take a hug. Uh, yeah. I, I think he I think he's a, take a giver of hugs. I think he's a hugger. Man, I don't think hugger. he's a hugger. I don't think he's a hugger. You don't think so? No. I think he is. I think he'd tell you to fuck off. Have you ever have you ever listened to his music? <laughs> it uh, does completely emasculate him. I will say that. <laughs> it, <that's, laughs> I'd say that he's listening to his music. <laughs> very different than John McClane. I'd say that he's listened to his music and he's very bitter now for having done so. <laughs> How could you not be?